All right. Welcome, folks. We're beginning our community chat about sort of our first look at the NCA5. It's possible we'll have more people coming on, but we've got Carolyn, Len, and Jay here, which actually gives us some good uh, representation geographically. We'll give everyone a minute to introduce themselves. I'm in Iowa. You've probably run across me because it's unlikely this is the first video that YouTube is going to show you from American Resiliency. So I, I'm a scientist who lives in Iowa, and I'm trying to do uh, climate outreach work full time through the channel. And we've we're at an important precipice with having the new projections, the NCA five come out. We're not going to get new federal projections until at least uh, four or five years from now. So what we've got now is what we've got. Getting through it is going to be important. Uh, Carolyn, would you mind starting off with a brief introduction? Hi, I'm Carolyn, and I live in Littleton, Colorado, a southern suburb of Denver. Um, I <clears throat> have was born and raised here in Littleton, and I uh, went to school at CU Boulder in my degrees in environmental conservation. And I, uh, uh, um, oh, I've been watching climate stuff since I was in college um, in the early 80s. Uh, because we talked about it in a lot of classes. So I've been following and the research and um, the progress and the the, uh, the projections and how they're playing out um, all that time. So here we are. We've, we've, we've come quite a way since then. You know, a lot of the stuff that in the 80s seemed so improbable is unfolding now. Len, can you give us just a short intro about where you're at. Unmute, unmute. I always do that. Uh, I'm Lynn, I am in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Uh, I'm a native Georgian and I have an interest in what all is going on in the US Southeast. Uh, and I'm very concerned about way, the way things are going. So uh, that's me. I tell you, when you look at Georgia in the NCA5, that is one of the interesting unfolding bright spots as we get to the projections. I, there's some figures in that Southeast section I want to pull up today. Jay, can you take a second? Tell us about where you are. Yeah, hi, I'm Jay. I'm uh, in Wausau, Wisconsin, North Central Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I just, uh, after I retired a few years ago, I just, I started looking at the climate stuff and, and why people were saying everything would be okay. And I and I thought, well, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and so things aren't going to be okay. And so what can we do, you know, in our communities? And so glad to find this channel. So, you know, I do think that there is nothing in the NCA5 that makes me think taking a focus off the community-based approach is prudent. Yeah, community looks to be very important. Ash, you're muted. We can't see you. Do you want to participate? Hey there, how are you? Hey. Can you hear me? Glad to see you. Yeah, we can hear you. Let's let's hear where you are, if you don't mind introducing yourself a bit. Yeah, I'm in Boise, Idaho. I'm hiding in the basement right now because my kids are cleaning upstairs. But um, yeah, uh, I've known a lot about climate since college in the early 2000s, and it's just coming to a head. And so I'm trying to incorporate it as part of my practice. Um, doing some more resiliency measures for my clients and and for myself and trying to get the community involved here which is tough because it's Boise, Idaho but we're, we're working on it. Well you know getting community involvement and simultaneously hiding from children one's own children those are both major interests of mine. You can see from the slantiness of my environment that I am up in the top of the A-frame. Hopefully I'll hide successfully for this hour. So <laughs> I'm gonna screen share, speaking of children, there are a few different figures than we saw in the NCA4, which anyone who's looked at the fourth national climate assessment, it's like a very technical document, right? And in the NCA5, there were surprisingly many figures like this that were more about documenting how people feel about climate or how people feel climate is currently unfolding. 
And we can see this is a survey about how worried children are about climate. We don't have anyone who's very young. You know, we don't have any minors on this call. We don't have anyone under 20. But I think it's worth noting that 90% of young people are extremely freaked out about climate is basically what this says, right? So I feel like as we consider where we are and we consider if we're supported or not supported, there's a lot of information that the younger people are the more they care about this and the more scared they are. In my experience doing community work and doing work talking with children as part of community work, getting information out there to the younger generation is very important because otherwise they assume that we are all going to die like immediately, right? I don't know if any of you have had experiences with talking with young people, with talking with people in a classroom setting about climate projections, but I have found that the more we can help people get access to this stuff, particularly young people, they're not like as locked into the world as it has been, right? They want to be able to imagine to build a new world. And the more that we can help to get it out there and motivate and energize younger people, the support is there across every demographic group as we look towards people under 40 is really where the cutoff is. But I'll stop grandstanding on that. Does anyone have a question they want to ask or a figure they want to look at first before I go nuts trying to make you all help me figure out some of the water figures, which is where I'm really interested in going? I, I didn't see anything that... Um addressed uh, drought very directly. I mean, there's a lot of things about um, rainfall events, and, and uh, but I didn't really see much about, you know, frequency and length of, of drought. Um, it was interesting too, that water as excess was really what they were mostly looking at, right? If you don't mind, I'll pull up um, some of the figures related to water. I'm gonna pull up the figures related to water in the all figures page. So we can kind of uh, scroll through them and highlight which ones we wanna talk about. So there was a lot of interesting stuff here related to water. We see the projected changes in annual precipitation. And this here, I already am, I've been looking and looking at this. Has anyone else looked at this figure 4.3? All right, we're going over to look at it big. Did that work? Can you all see 4.3 big here? Cool. So it looks to me, and I still need to get into the methods, right? This report has been out for days. Like the difference between their average wettest 20 projections and their driest 20% of projections has a really high variance, right? We're talking about an enormous range in the models. And it gives me some concern that they didn't throw this models out. These, um, like, did they reality check the wettest 20% of the models? Because we know from multiple lines of evidence, multiple sources of evidence, that we do expect to see a drought trend in the Southwest, right? I think those yeah, look yeah. just like outliers, you know, the average versus the mean. And yeah, yeah those are, those are seem like the least likely of, of uh, uh, projections, things to happen. To me in the key of the explanation in the text, I have to go back to the original paper and look at the methodology because I'm very concerned about how did they parse these outliers. I mean, look mm -hmm. at the difference here in Northern Oregon. This really jumped out to me. Your wettest 20% shows Northern Oregon very dry and then wetter. In the driest projections, Northern Oregon is wetter. 
Yeah, so I noticed that too. It's like if the models are that different and they're not throwing anything out as an outlier, it was troubling to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm, I'm glad they're showing this. And like, why don't we see the wettest and driest for Alaska and Hawaii? Why mm -hmm. do we only see the average there? That bothered you too, Len? Yeah. I noticed that when I looked at it, that well, and the Oregon sure. thing. Okay, I'm, I'm glad it's, you know, looking at these trends, it's good to have someone else confirm what you see, right? I want to put together a piece here that's bothering me also about Hawaii, right? We may remember from the previous project from NCA for analysis, we have this trend of drought in Hawaii. And we've seen this terrible drought trend in Hawaii result in that awful fire this year, right? And we see strong drought trend as expected on this map. And then hold on, I'm going to stop share. I have to pull up another figure that I'm just like so skeptical of. Here we go. Just a second. I got it up. So this is average changes for precipitation under an RCP 8.5 model for annual precipitation in the Pacific Islands. And it appears to completely contradict all of that evidence, right? That's well, the way I would read it. And this is from the, say again, which report this is from? The every figure that I'm showing today is from NCA5. Okay. Okay. So it's so from the same report. It's from the same report. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that the, first figure. Oh, Len, please go on. No, I was going to say, am I reading this right? That if you look at Hawaii, <clears throat> the average is up 6.1. <clears throat> and and the 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 one on the left is up slightly, and only the one in the middle is down. Oh, well, well this is economic zone. It's it's percent it's precipitation related though. Ah, just a second here. Uh, so let uh, me pull out. I'm gonna go over to thirty point three in the figure pull down, and we'll look at thirty point three from all figures because yeah, I think. The three arrows were seasonal. The first one was the full year, and then the other two were different halves of the year. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's gonna take me just a second. I'm sorry. This is like a huge report, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's projected changes in rainfall at three C. I'm viewing in chapter, and now I'm sharing it over. We'll be able to look at more texts. I was. This to me was the biggest contradiction that I found within the report or between NCA4 and all preceding climate assessments at NCA5. So we're scrolling here and we are talking about rainfall. We're looking at the change and they are defining it ec through economic zone, but here the economic zones are geographic, right? Yeah. And in those figures, we're looking at um, a seasonal change and it's percentage change. So we're not like when this is plus 8.4, it's plus 8.4%, not like another 8.4 inches or whatever other unit, right? But I'm just really confused because this does not square with the other data or with the average precipitation mm. figure that we just looked at in chapter four. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I agree with you. It doesn't square. <clears throat> it, and it doesn't square with the observed reality either is what is really troubling too. Mm -hmm. Seems like two different authors or something. Sorry. Um, well, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, two different authors looking at two different data sets. Yeah. 
Because this. I want to know. Just so we can get on the same page in terms of modeling scenarios, because there are a variety of different modeling scenarios for the different figures. That averaged one we were looking at, that's a RCP 4.5. That is one where we try to cruise in bringing emissions down. And this figure is an 8.5. So this should be a worse scenario. This is if we don't bring emissions down, where every other source of information I've read about the Pacific Islands and measurements from the Pacific Islands talk about a decrease. And then this prominent figure shows this major increase. Yeah, does it? Does it cite the sources for this um, for this figure? Yeah. And that's why I say I got to look into the methods. Yeah. I don't suppose they'll make the source data available, will they? This is an important difference in the NCA5 is that I read the data permissions appendix and all of the data is supposed to be publicly accessible. You know how there's that move in academia where you publish the data set as well as the analysis? These are all supposed to have public sets, which, you know, if we could get some data science people who are interested in putting volunteer hours in, it's a, interesting opportunity to see what's going on with those ensemble projections for figure four. And mm -hmm. there was a question, if I can jump back a bit, you were talking about the different authors, right? Mm -hmm. the, the types of authors for this report are very different from previously. Previous reports, it was all field experts where they decided that it would improve this report if they had people from a wide variety of career levels contribute. And so there's undergraduate authors work is represented in this report. Len, the face that you made is one that I am I'm making side all the time. Well, it's, it's to this. I don't want anybody to think that that undergraduate authors always do a bad job. OK. Uh, I mean, I don't have a, a master's degree myself. I have two undergraduate degrees, and I pride myself in the work that I do. But, but uh, when you when I hear that that uh, some of the content is is not is done by undergraduates, I wonder to what extent they've been supervised. What concerns me is that when we see the attribution, when we see the citation of sources. We're kind of, as a reader, expecting them to all have the same expertise, right? But when mm -hmm. we look at these very different models, and like when I look at the figure four models, where someone clearly put a lot of time into this ensemble modeling, but it's not clear how they sorted the variance, if they limited variance, if they cut outliers, like you would want people to be highly supervised. We do want the innovation, the creativity, of younger people and of people who are coming out of field and looking at something with fresh new eyes, right? Sometimes you get a structural engineer in the mix and they're like, actually, this is going to collapse. This isn't going to make any sense. Right. But, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a process, like a team process. And I'm not sure where we are with that, with this document. Yeah. I, I think, uh, it, I think the whole thing would have been, would have benefited from having a blended team rather than maybe having individuals of different skill levels and, and education levels going off and, and doing their own thing, which is what I'm understanding. It was a highly reviewed document. It went okay. through many rounds of review, but each chapter was written by a different team. And it's, you know, the, the process would have been variable within teams. Yeah. And I still have to get in. I still have to read, you know, like the every word approach. Right now I've been, I've looked over all of the figures and I've seen some figures I'm really interested in. And I've seen some figures I have some big beefs with. And I know, I don't mean to bring like too much of a negative energy, but the weirdness, the contrast of this figure with everything else we know about projections for Hawaii I felt like it was a good way for me to try to highlight my concerns in a community setting. 
I was hoping you all would find something where I could be like, oh, I just misunderstood, but I, I don't get the impression that's the direction we're going. But Emily, I think it seems like it's not so much adding negative energy as just curious energy. Like, you know, it's just, let's learn more about this. What, you know, it's just curious mm. that there's a difference and, and, you know, it's worth looking into. And, it's, you know, maybe we're sending a few emails to, to ask these authors what's going on. That's a good way to think about it. And that's, thanks for like reorienting us you know, into a more nurturing, a better forward growing emotional wavelength. You know, if we can stay in a place of curiosity, that's better for me than uh, like veering into pure skepticism. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Was the uh, base period on this one the same as the other one? It, if you scroll down a little bit, it said something about the base period, which. Um... Okay. So we're looking at change by end of century relative to 85 to 2014. Yeah, so, so both at beginning and end point, are those different? Mm -hmm. That's pretty bumped forward data set. Often, you know, where we're used to looking at like 70s to early 2000s. But those last 10 years in the islands, we saw the drying trend happen. So I would be surprised. Well, well plus, this is a good point three. though, as we as we try to align. What Wait, were you plus, saying? No, I'm sorry. Plus three over that time period would be like plus four <laughs> in the, the way we normally talk about this, right? Yeah, looking over the longer period of time like that. Hmm. So I, I wonder if it's even the same scenario, you know, is is this the they don't they don't have the this the 8.5 tag on there. Unit of Does measurement. Have 8 I'm surprised how many different scenarios were included in the modeling, in various modelings here. I saw some teams that were modeling like the equivalent of a 1.6 scenario, like a very unlikely scenario, right? Like we're not going to immediately reduce emissions to zero. It's not going to happen, right? I was surprised to see that still included in the modeling. And um, I was also surprised that they didn't um, often model more than one scenario. Teams usually like picked one and stuck with it, which I thought was a little odd. Mm -hmm. That was a thing that I had really liked about the NCA4 was that often we saw RCP 4.5 next to 8.5. Yeah. There are some of the some of the charts where they they have overlays and you can see what it looks like in at plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 degrees and and overlay one over the other which is kind of nice. I, it, it, go ahead. No, I liked that a lot too. Please continue. I'm going to pull up a couple of examples for that where I have another point of curiosity. And I want to hear more, too, from you. You were talking about um, you feel that there's things that are missing or to add. And I want to hear what that means to you. I'm curious what speaks to you there. Yeah, I, I, I haven't looked at this very much, but it's I was trying to drill down into was there some data, actually. And there's a big chunk of things that say uh, coming soon, um, you know, where it, it gets into some of the more detailed things, it seems. Oh, I, I like that you can't download it as PDFs, that you have to scroll through these infinite websites. I know they'll get the PDFs, of that, they'll, they'll get them up eventually, but I find it hard to read in a way where you can study in the current format. Mm -hmm. I was also concerned a little bit with the uh, the verbiage that I mean I mostly read the the text around the Southwest because Colorado is part of the Southwest. So what do you do when you look at Google Maps? You look at your house, <laughs> and you look at this. You look I you know look at my region, and um, you know it was the language that they used around what's projected to happen in this part of the world was so it was a little bit 
you know, um, science jargon, but it was also, I think, soft peddling um, based, you know, compared to like what the, the the figures show, the maps and the, you know, the charts. And I, um, I had a little bit of concern about that as well. I would agree. I thought the tone in that section and in the Northeast was um, almost more bubbly than the figures indicated. Yeah, yeah it, it was, it was like, you know, not on the ground, you know, it, I mean, they talked about things, I mean, just like food insecurity versus, um, we're not going to make the food that we used to here and it's going to get really expensive. And there are people who aren't good, who aren't, who already can't afford it. You know, more, more upfront. Yeah, I, I did notice that Kansas looks like it's going to turn into a desert, right? Uh, <laughs> Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, Kansas and Oklahoma, as well as a lot of Texas. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're all familiar with the 100th Meridian um, thing. Yeah. Um, but that's where, if you looked at um, the Earth at night, you know, the N NASA pictures of the Earth at night, and you see that the eastern U.S. is just full of light, and then there's kind of a dividing line, and then it's much sparser. And if you look at the rest of the world, there are areas like, you know, Nepal and Mongolia are really <laughs> devoid of lights. And, and um, that dividing line has traditionally been on the 100th meridian. And it just speaks to the carrying capacity of the land and where it's too dry, you can't have the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, concentration or the population that leads to, you know, more, um, more organized cultures. And that and that generally fell along the 100th meridian where it was dry to the west and wetter to the east and could support more people. And now the 100th meridian, the figures in terms of precipitation seems to have shifted to about the 95th meridian. So shifted to the east and um, is like progressing so that that dry, you know, in observations right now that the drier areas so in the coming you know 20 30 years maybe Minneapolis will look more like Denver is now and I'm thinking Denver will look like Chihuahua so it, you know it's it's enough said <laughs> if you if you look at the um if I may if you look at the um climate history back right after the end of the ice age when we went through the the thermal maximum i think it's called uh that or the thermal optimum though as a friend of mine says it's optimum only if you're a gila monster or a sand flea uh most of the us was very desert like that's why we have the the sand hills there oh, in, in, in sure enough yeah and then it went all the way east nearly to the the mississippi river uh, of much drier conditions than now. So uh, my friend keeps saying, well, now that we're heating up again, that's happening again. It's just moving that way. Uh, so that would be interesting, Emily, to get your take on that since you've, you've uh, probably have more experience with that information than I do. Well, you know, the more you look into the natural cycles of North American climates, and that last video that I did, the Caves of Doom video, is is yeah. directly about that, that we have had greater desertification in the central U.S. before. You know, at the time that it was surveyed in the late 17, early 1800s, it was described as the Great Western Desert, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact that we're experiencing change, I think, is the the key thing to focus in on, on these conversations it does appear that we have super uh charged this cycle of change 
And that even if it was only going to be as bad as previous cycles that have destroyed complex human civilizations, you know, an El Nino of similar intensity to what we look to be going into, many people think helped to contribute to the collapse of the Incan Empire. And that was a very sophisticated, large scale empire. You know, we, we can't take it lightly, no matter what we think the reason is. It's like, do we want to focus on identifying why our house is on fire or, or try to put the fire out? <laughs> well, I don't know, even know if we can't put the fire out. It's just learning that we're going to have to live in a different house or our houses. We're going to have to live in a burned out house or, yeah. you know, if you have the means, you can move. That's great. But most people don't. And so it's how to live in that changed, burnt down neighborhood. You know, it's yeah, you know, like what are the places of hope? Where can we dig in? Are there parts we can save? You know, if Matt Damon, know. if if Matt Damon can, can can grow potatoes on Mars, we can probably grow something in Colorado, right? <laughs> well, you know, they. Well, it's about the carrying capacity of the land and this part of the world, even in the most, you know, the last thousand years or so, um, didn't support uh, uh, organized large populations. So where you had like the the uh, the civilizations or the, the cultures uh, along the Mississippi River versus the Plains Native Americans, that it was much less populated. They were in smaller groups and they had a hunting gathering culture because that part of the world can't on its own support agriculture. And so it, it but it can support hunting and gathering. Um, but we we get inputs those who live as, who live in the dry west we get inputs from all around the world and from ancient aquifers so um we we've been living beyond the carrying capacity for a long time and now it's time for an adjustment like there's a, an adjustment in the stock market you know it's it's um we never the land here never could support the population that we have and i don't think it it certainly won't in the future because the desertification is going north and going east. Yeah, I, I I think that the thing that I try to always take away from these, it gets reinforced all the time, is that that really climate change is one piece, an important piece, but still one piece of a much bigger and more intractable problem, and that is overshoot. As a species, we're overshooting the carrying capacity of the planet. And until we stop, well, we're going to stop one way or another. But, you know, if we don't stop, then it'll be the bad way it'll stop. I think that's a very a wise way to speak about it. And talking about this overshoot, talking about the carrying capacity... I like what you were saying, Carolyn, about the the water and you, you know, that areas that are drawing on aquifers, right? The, people, the areas that are going way deep into their water storage. I feel like the water chapter to me was the most important for looking forward because it's where we see carrying capacity, where we see water is where we see life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... If you look at that, the world at night um, image from NASA, well, if you, you know, it gets sparser as you go west in, in the United States. But if you look at Mexico, like um, Chihuahua, especially northeastern Chihuahua and Sonora, northwestern Sonora, um, there aren't lights. And that's because it's really, really dry there. And it just can't support the population. Even with all of today's technology and amenities, it still just cannot support the population. Well, let's say if, if we have kind of a general collapse in the next few years of, of agriculture, wouldn't one of the simplest things to do 
would be to grow grain for people rather than animals and and fuel. I mean, if we stopped the ethanol and we stopped feedlot production, I mean that would give us that would give us like twice as much uh, grain available for for people to consume, right? And I don't think it's it. Uh, I think it's land. Right. I want to look at these water figures. I'm going to pull them up. I'm sorry for forcing everyone to look over here. But talking about this water and carrying capacity and starting to talk about agriculture, I have a figure that I think is important to talk about together so that I can make sure that I'm understanding it. And that is changes in evapotranspiration. Excuse me, I almost dropped a syllable in the gigantic word. And then soil moisture changes. So this figure is looking at our projections for how much water plants are gonna be using. And it says in the key that you are gonna see that decrease in some areas where the precipitation is decreasing because it's gonna be too dry for the plants. So here in the Southwest, we, it says basically that the plant life is going to be suffering so much it's not really gonna be as active anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And then, excuse me, I'm Blair witching you. All right, now they've got soil moisture. It shows the soil moisture, the amount of available water on average increasing slightly in that area, even though we see the drought trend. And I wonder what's up with that. It seems to me like there's another potential variance because look at the spread yeah. on this soil yeah. moisture modeling. Yeah, I mean, to me, it doesn't make any sense either. I was looking at Georgia. Georgia is supposed to be wetter overall, and yet it's showing overall lower soil moisture. I, well, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look all along the headwaters of the Mississippi here. How can you have a model generating that level of variance, maximum variance all throughout the headwaters there? This is when I've come back and I've been looking at it and looking at it. I've been looking at it every day and I try not to look at Alaska because that's just terrifying, right? <laughs> I just... They don't dovetail, they don't die. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like you're 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 talking about at least a bimodal distribution. If you were to print out every graph, right? Every map that this would generate, there there and there have to be multiple clustering points, right? And how mm -hmm. are they waiting which which ones are actually coming out? I'm sorry, mm -hmm. that was very inelegantly said. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Wisconsin, I mean, we're supposed to have more precipitation, but less soil moisture, quite a bit less. And the difference for Wisconsin, I was thinking about you, Jay, when I looked at these maps, the difference for Wisconsin is crazy. Right. And like, close your eyes if it makes you nauseous for a second. I'll tell you when we're saying, I got to go back up here and look at um, the average precipitation. Mm -hmm. The average precipitation map, which we looked at before, for um, the Midwest, for Wisconsin, it's just a, like, how can you go off of the difference there? And we were talking about this sensitive region here, this very um, sensitive to small changes in precipitation across Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And we can see tremendous model variants especially for Oklahoma like how how can we have a model that's logically including both of those futures for Oklahoma and say that the average means anything yeah well, that, I, I mean I gotta look in the methods before I make these big statements maybe they talk better about how they filtered it out but just on the face the way this figure is designed it's blowing my mind yeah yeah go ahead I was going to say, did you, did you see Nicole's question? I just saw that. Nicole, I didn't know that you were in the room. Thank you for joining us. And I got this on is late. an excellent I question. I popped on a little late, sorry. Well, let's let's take a second. And um, 
you know what, in the text here. So let's go down and look at that soil moisture thing again. I'm, I'm glad to have you all to look at it with me because it is, uh, I think that this is one of the most potentially important as we're looking at carrying capacity figures in the, in the whole report. And yet it is, there's a lot of unanswered questions. The method is very important, right? So we're talking about the figure credit coming from University of Colorado Boulder, which is usually pretty responsive institution where we could ask them. We're talking about difference in inches for soil moisture. And it is true, like, what does that mean remains a relevant question, doesn't it, Nicole? I'm oh, no, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, because we know that there is a soil, a loss of soil, like, you know, arable, farmable soil, loss of microbes, loss of um, fungus, and maybe the variable we're looking at is, I don't know, wind, possibly. The wind taking the soil. That's why my question is that dead dirt does not hold on to moisture like actual soil. Mm-hmm. Mineral soil versus biological soil, yeah. Right. And talking about difference of inches, when you're talking about all these different soil types, is hard to understand. Mm -hmm. And I love that you brought up wind, that you brought up modeling wind, which right now we're still being forced to look at that very indirectly when we know that wind if it's not i mean it should be part of these models right it should be underlying it all right i'm scrolling up to see okay so this is all the text we have on soil moisture related to this figure and we can see that this is not giving us a substantive answer to your question is it whoa this is really like not enough information to let us interpret that figure, is it? There are other things. I think when I was looking at the CMIP, CMIP, you know, um, projections, they do talk about, there are more in depth about what soil moisture is and it's in the top three feet or, you know, meter of soil or top two meter, those have better definitions for what soil moisture is, because that's what I've been looking at, is amount of precipitation is kind of immaterial. It's how long, how, how much can the soil hang on to the water? And yeah, you know, cl clay soils hold more than sandy soils. And, and so I think a little bit of better definitions certainly are called for in this report. I don't know what that's about, why they don't. It's good that we have the ability to reach out to authors to try to get more information. And I'm sure that there was a lot of pressure related to word limits and all that kind of stuff, you know, where maybe we can get this spelled out for us better. And maybe we can get some more answers on what's going on with the modeling. So who is taking this and 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 making it into something connected with agricultural productivity? Who's who's working on that? So Jay, you were at the Midwest Climate Resilience Conference with me. And mm -hmm. most of those organizations with tables like the, the GLISA, RISA, those are organizations that may help to translate this report for ag extension offices, for example. And there are city governments and state officials who have used the fourth NCA to translate. But, you know, you and I were in the session about the NCA-5 together. And I wonder if you remember the one of the lead authors there was asking everyone how they're gonna use this in their work. And that's because that's how it gets out there. The NCA-5, the, the federal organizations that contributed to making the NCA-5, they don't have any funding for direct communication. 
And that's part of why I started American Resiliency, because there wasn't anyone else doing direct communication to the public of the projections. There's communication through a variety of channels, but it's not organized and it's often civic facing or industry facing rather than public facing. And the penetration is not good, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Talking so maybe, about no, please, please go on. So I wonder if maybe we should start making a list of questions and then categorize that list, whether it's by region or by, um, you know, climate, whatever, water, wind, you know, that sort of thing. And to just kind of follow up to clarify what are the studies behind it and, you know, what was their methodology in, in creating these maps and things? Is that the kind of thing that would be the job of American resiliency to do? Well, it's my job if I say it is, as I have now really moved into mad scientist territory. <laughs> you know, like I don't have any government or state funding. I'm a nonprofit organization. To me, the question is, what's the best way to help people access this information in a useful, usable way? And to address that, first we have to say, which of, what information here is useful or usable? And I'm concerned that unless we dig further into this crucial water information, that it may not be useful or usable. In contrast, so what you observed in the section for the Southwest and what I've seen skimming, doing a quick read of the Northeast, the sections for the Midwest, the Northern Great Plains and the Southern Great Plains are highly detailed, technical and include figures where the methodology I feel more comfortable with. I wanna share an uh, example. Jay, I think this is one that you um, liked as an overlay figure, I'm gonna guess. Do you see this one where we're talking about um, the different modeling scenarios and historical change all presented? Yeah, I was muted there. Yeah, that that makes sense too. There's there's also an interactive one where you can actually slide over the top. But, um, but yeah, this is good. And I thought the Midwest one was better than this the subject one that you were just looking at. I hadn't looked at that before, but the, I thought the Midwest one was pretty well done. Yeah, I like the Midwest one. The Midwest chapter has a lot of good stuff going on. I want to scroll through and show some of the figures just as examples of figures that are um, clearer and have clearer methodology. This trends in last freeze dates for spring. I thought this was very nicely done at the county level where they show like the trend lines that they're modeling. I felt like that really helped me have some faith in the data was seeing that intermediate step, that like prefigure step. And they really had like pretty good um, references, density of references. And I'm sorry to just be scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. I know that this is really obnoxious, but this was one of the figures that I thought was funny as an Iowan, where you can see that our opossum rich environment has kept our endemic Lyme disease cases <laughs> low. <laughs> where, where we see Lyme disease exploding, it's in places that are far enough north, they don't have enough possums yet. So y'all need more. They're creepy looking and they're great. So what is it about possums that keep Lyme disease down? They love to eat too. They go around uh, and they eat the ticks just like M&Ms, if you want a repulsive image. <laughs> That's a pretty great image, yeah. Yummy ticks. I, have a, I, I put together a brush pile to try and attract more possums. There we go. This is a nice one. And then I'm going to stop forever scrolling. But there are a number of figures in the Midwest section and also in the Northern and Southern Great Plains sections where we see seasonal modeling and we see them break out different scenarios. And so we can see if there's a stable climb, 
Not like that ensemble modeling when we're like, wow, their modeling scenarios encompass complete opposites, you know? Mm. This uh, runoff breakdown one, I thought this was potentially useful. But if we can talk strategy for trying to get this information out there, I'd like to hear what you all think about this. I was thinking that for those three regions, Northern Great Plains, Southern Great Plains, and Midwest, where there is this type of data visualization that my, my thought is that it's helpful to start doing some state level forecasts where we feel like we have you know, useful data to show and then pull some, take some time to ask questions in those other sections, like the Southwest section, where the vibe maybe is about keeping people calm instead of keeping people informed when you when you read the language. Maybe ask more questions before we even try to write the scripts for those states. Mm -hmm. Question. Oh, no, oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead, Carolyn. Oh, I was just going to say, doing the videos is great. Uh, I'd personally like to see something that people can download from the website, like a PDF file that that had action items they could take or information they could take to their local community authorities uh, mm. to help uh, facilitate action. And I'd certainly be willing to volunteer to help that after the first of the year when I retire. I Congrats. love that idea. I love the idea of stuff being more downloadable so that, you know, if my content ever got wiped, you could have it, you know, before I had time to restore it. I have backups of everything, but that might not be useful if I lose a platform, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are a lot of um, there are a lot of cyber attacks going on right now. Uh, a friend of mine had her uh, channel taken down uh, by people who were transmitting these uh, uh, what do you call them uh, the money things, the crypto stuff. They basically hmm. took over her site. The ransomware. No, it wasn't ransomware. It was they took a, they they did an attack, took over her site, her uh, channel, and started transmitting uh, uh, fake uh, uh, cyber. What what do they call it? The the crypto cryptocurrency stuff to try and get people to to do cryptocurrency. So you got to be very careful of that. And sorry, don't don't mean to sidetrack us. I mean, like I these security concerns are worth noting. There, it's it's worth noting that we don't live in a stable internet age. When I look back to, you know, the year two thousand, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the like art and weird flash movies that I liked, you can't find them anymore. The Wayback Machine did not catch everything, right? Yep. I liked what Len was saying about. Um, breaking down that information and taking it to an authority or to, to make those actionable items that people could do on their own. Like I'm looking for a, you know, a plant that's going to be heat resistant and, you know, able to to tolerate drought as much as I can see, you know, and, and what does that mean? Does that mean we need to, you know, take this actionable item of look and see what kind of trees are going to grow best in your environment to your, you know, urban tree council or whatever, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. I wonder if we did it like on, um, I always love the, the catchphrase, let's get ready, you know? And so um, how do you get ready on an individual level? How do you get ready on your local, you know, um, uh, township or, or, county level or your local um, uh, municipality and then you know how do states need to get ready and I wonder if a layering like that with actionable items maybe that's biting off too much but <laughs> You know, thinking about it. Some work to do. You know, if I can manage to get off the runway and I'm I'm getting closer all the time. 
you know, we have a very low cost of living out here. I'm getting closer all the time to being able to do this indefinitely. And I keep working on it. I think that it's worth trying to move forward like we have a future, right? Because how, how else do you make a good one? But to work forward trying to make it every day. I think that looking at this and taking some time to think about how can we handle it seriously, like I said at the beginning of the call, we're not getting another dose. This is the info we're going to get. This is the fifth climate assessment. We won't get another one for four or five years. Yeah, and regardless of, hopefully we have a good future, but regardless of the future we have, we have to live with it. So best to make something, uh, to, to make it as livable as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, you know, make it as good as you can make it. And if we can understand what's going on with that water projection data, it's such a powerful way for us to think about carrying capacity, for us to think about where should people go and start building the future that we can live in, you know? It does still look like um, Northern Midwest. There's nothing in there that makes me concerned about new threats to the Northern Midwest. That did seem concerning, the ensemble modeling, even with how crazy it looks. It looks like the Northeast has much more precipitation than we were looking at before, to the point where it, there's just like hydroengineering challenges there that look pretty serious, right? When we talk about areas that looked sweet in the NCA4 that still look good, where we have more clarity, Pennsylvania, uh, along the mountains, they looked pretty stable in the new models, still looked pretty good. And North Georgia um, was one of the very few places in the Southeast that was looking at projected increases in agricultural output. I don't know if anyone saw that county by county map in the Southeast of ag output. I haven't seen it yet. Well, you know, I, maybe I should do like a walkthrough by region because that's how I started the videos before was doing regional walkthroughs. And then I can make it clear, you know, Californians, we're not going to get you a state level forecast for a little while because we're concerned about these sources and we really need time to dig into it. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. you guys are going to be in the first 10 out because I think we do have enough to tell you that story, Oklahoma. And just handle it like that you know that way i'm not waiting two years to turn out the perfect video with the d minus uh video quality you all have come to expect from me but uh you know we're, we're telling the story together we're exploring together and when we have more questions when we have that curiosity that you helped us get into that emotional channel of curiosity that we have a, a, a path forward where we can be curious together so you're saying do a summary and then do regional summaries and then do the states. I'm probably going to have to do regional summaries that will give us some questions about the states and then build up to the whole again. Hmm. I'm inclined, you know, everyone wants to know what's the big picture, right? But the more I studied doing the state-by-state -state approach, the first round of it, I, it really changed my understanding at a deep level of the national picture. Seeing all of the challenges and opportunity, doing a ground up, really, it was uh, so, there were so many things I didn't expect and where my like assumptions had overlaid my first looks at the big maps, right? I found like I was better able to challenge my assumptions and identify misconceptions I didn't know I held when I did that small scale exploration first. I don't know if I'm making sense though. I'm sorry. Yeah. But you know, we're at the hour and I told people that I would come down and they're going to come up here if I don't. So I should probably go. It's been really good to talk with everyone. I hope that you all enjoyed being here, it was very important for me to be able to talk with other people, 
and talk if we're seeing the same trends, the questions that everyone brought up, Nicole, you like, I feel like you really helped crack open some of the questions we need to ask about the soil data as we move forward. And just, you know, starting to think organizationally about what are our community goals? What are our goals for this project? It was all, all really good for me. So thank you so much for being here. Hey folks, I want to take a few minutes here to support everyone who contributes to the community, who supports the work. You can see from our chat that there's going to be a lot of volunteer opportunities coming up. I really think that this is an important year as we have the NCA5 released to make the most of this data and try to put together the best on the ground, informative, useful projection information we can so that every American has what they need to access information to get ready. Thanks for being here. It's so important to me, the community that we're building here with American Resiliency, so that when we have questions about the information we're receiving, like we were able to do in the chat today, we can get together, we can talk about it, we can make a plan to move forward. I'm really glad that we're getting ready together. Thanks, everyone.